I would like to ask you at this time to make sure that your cell phones are put onto silent mode. And now I will also ask you to rise, if you are able, as the mayor and members of council enter the council chamber. Please be seated. Good afternoon, Mayor Tory, members of council, esteemed colleagues, distinguished guests, and to everyone who's joining us today by live stream. Uh, my name is John Elvich, I'm the city clerk, and it is my pleasure to call the first meeting of the 2022 to 2026 city council to order. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the Indigenous peoples of all the lands that we are on today. I would like to take a moment on behalf of City Council to acknowledge the importance of the land which we call, each call home. We do this to reaffirm our commitment and responsibility in improving relationships between nations 
and to deepening our understanding of indigenous peoples and their cultures. We acknowledge that the land City Council is meeting on today is the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabeg, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples. Toronto is also home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit and Métis peoples, and we acknowledge that Toronto is covered by Treaty 13 with the Mississaugas of the Credit. Mayor Tory, members of council, honored guests, it is my pleasure to introduce Gary Sue, Ojibwe elder and storyteller from the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation. Bajo, Ogashige Higan and Indishnakas, Magazine Dodem. It was nice to see the councillors uh, smudge themselves, and uh, but they should remember when they're smudging that they smudge so that they can only hear good words, and that their mouth speaks only good words, and that it comes from their heart. So, uh, with that, Nunakama Manitou, let us pray. Namkagiwin, Wasa Kabinjabam, Gwinishki Babigum, Kadeka Zimwadak, Wida Bimshanam, Wida Opnishnam, Asia Bejago, Makadein, Asia Bejago, and then down them. And the words say, Welcome, you've come far. And we've waited long. Come and sit down beside us and share in the same food that allies our hunger. And then let us rise uh, with one good heart and one good mind. And we've got to remember that every day we feed our bodies with the food uh, that uh, feeds, feeds us. And every day uh, we feed uh, our minds so that we could have good thoughts. Uh, and when we feed our spirit, we feed the spirit of our nation. So let's uh, have that uh, oneness together inside of this council so that we can accomplish things, so that we can do things that uh, govern and help uh, our uh, people in a good way and then uh, with uh, those kind of uh, things we can't fail. So now I'm going to uh, call upon uh, my uh, wife, uh, Tina, Elder Tina Sue, and she's going to give a blessing of uh, water. And uh, water is uh, uh, with us, this is fire. Uh, with her, she's the carrier, and uh, as every woman is, the carrier of water. Anin Tina Disnikaz. Ninako dam nungum kagi zigak, weon jenny be. Kami nikwe young weni be. Igae mizue kap miji young weni be. Midesimine keji kidoad. Apiche e a ya go when he be me miziwe me jiong me that's a mini kezi kid one miigwech what i just said was um i'm blessing the water today we um we honor it we we drink it it flows in the rivers and lakes and and inside of us miigwech
I have to tell you that uh, we, we are going to pass the uh, water in uh, little cups. Uh, it's because we did a ceremony outside with our own council uh, of uh, Aboriginal people uh, to bless the water so that uh, this council uh, could have a sharing of the water with uh, the First Nations people. And so when we're uh, passing around these cups, uh, we ask that uh, to have patience because if you don't have patience, you'll become one. And so uh, when we're, while we're passing this around, uh, you can say your own little prayer. And then uh, once uh, the water is all distributed, then uh, we'll uh, drink it. And uh, we will then uh, rise in uh, one good heart and one good mind. So let's uh, drink this water. And uh, the water came from a, a silver pitcher. And it's old and it's tarnished. Uh, just like uh, the words that uh, uh, were given to us in the past. Uh, they shone so bright and so nice. Uh, and now uh, they're faded and black because they, uh, they're not living up to their part of uh, the treaties that uh, were given to us. So I've uh, left this uh, pot here uh, with you so that uh, you can shine it and take uh, that uh, blackness off of uh, 
the words that were spoken in the past and let the, the, our words here in the future shine in a beautiful way. Jimmy Witch. Uh, Elder Gary and Elder Tina, on behalf of Toronto City Council, thank you very much for being with us today and for your words and your blessing. Uh, it will truly help Council uh, start the new term in a good way. I'm now pleased to welcome the choir from the Claude Watson School of the Arts to the chamber and invite the choir to lead us in singing of our national anthem. So if you are able, please stand for the national anthem and please remain standing for a moment of silence and reflection. Please be seated. The Claude Watson School for the Arts, located in North York, offers an enriched arts education for students spanning from grade four to grade eight. I'd like to thank these accomplished students and their teacher, Linda Song, for their wonderful rendition of O Canada. And I'd also like to thank the Young Creek Big Drum for leading our procession today. We will now turn to the business at hand, organization of the council and the confirmation of election results. As the city clerk for the city of Toronto, I can confirm that I have declared the official 2022 municipal election results in accordance with the Municipal Elections Act. The members present here today have been duly elected and are entitled to be members of the council of the city of Toronto for a four year term starting November 15th, 2020. 22. To Mayor Tory and members of council, I extend my congratulations to you. Now the next item of business today is the making of the declaration of office by the mayor and the presentation of the chain of office. I will now call upon his worship, uh, Mayor Tory, to make the declaration of uh, office. Mayor Tory, would you please rise and repeat after me? I, John Tory, having been elected to the office of mayor in the city of Toronto, do solemnly promise and declare that. I, John Tory, having been elected to the office of mayor in the city of Toronto, do solemnly promise and declare that. I will truly, faithfully, and impartially exercise this office to the best of my knowledge and ability. I will truly, faithfully, and impartially exercise this office to the best of my knowledge and ability. I have not received and will not receive any payment or reward 
or promise thereof for the exercise of this office in a biased, corrupt, or any improper manner. I have not received and will not receive any payment or reward or promise thereof for the exercise of this office in a biased, corrupt, or any improper manner. I will disclose any pecuniary interest, direct or indirect, in accordance with the Municipal Conflict of Interest Act. I will disclose any pecuniary interest, direct or indirect, in accordance with the Municipal Conflict of Interest Act. I will be faithful and bear true allegiance to His Majesty King Charles III. I will be faithful and bear true allegiance to His Majesty King Charles III. And I make this solemn promise and declaration conscientiously, believing it to be true and knowing that it is of the same force and effect as if made under oath. And I make this solemn promise and declaration conscientiously, believing it to be true and knowing that it is of the same force and effect as if made under oath. Mayor Troy, would you please sign the declaration? My honor to present the mayor. Well, go ahead and say your party privilege. Yes, yeah, sorry, uh, this isn't set up to. Uh... Why do I just have to? Uh... Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, uh, Mr. Elbridge. Um, I sought the advice of the clerk as to how appropriately to do so, and I stand on a point of privilege. Because without revealing it to the public during the election, or in any consultation with your colleagues who are also duly elected by the people of Toronto, you impugned the privilege of this assembly. By requesting that Premier Ford provide you undemocratic minority rule powers that are unprecedented in any democratically elected body anywhere in the world. The remedies that I propose that you take immediately to address the way that this assembly has been impugned, this assembly's privilege has been impugned, is that you, Mayor Tory, Bring this matter, Bill 39, to the first possible council agenda so that we can finally, as your fellow elected representatives, have an opportunity to discuss this. And second, that you stand in your place now, at long last, and declare that you are rescinding your request for these undemocratic powers and that you work with us, your fellow elected colleagues, and request that Premier Ford stop Bill 39. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Matlow, uh, thank you very much for that point of privilege. Uh, I will just tell you that uh, there will be a report forthcoming uh, to the City Council at its meeting in December, at which time, uh, because uh, some of the matters that you uh, made reference to are not even uh, passed into law as yet. They're still in front of the legislature uh, and that uh, that matter will be discussed at that time based on a staff report that will be uh, put into the hands of council with respect to uh, the so-called uh, strong mayor uh, authorities. Uh, and uh, furthermore, I'll just indicate that I will address this matter uh, in part, um, probably not to your satisfaction, but uh, I'll address this matter in part in my own remarks during my address this afternoon. Thank you, Mr. President. So, honored guests, it's now my honor to present His Worship Mayor Tory with the chain of office.
I will now call upon the members of council to rise if able and recite the declaration of office together. And so members of council, if you'll please repeat after me. I, having been elected to the office of councillor in the city of Toronto, do solemnly promise and declare that. I will truly, faithfully, and impartially exercise this office to the best of my knowledge and ability. I have not received and will not receive any payment or reward or promise thereof for the exercise of this office in a biased, corrupt, or any improper manner. I will disclose any pecuniary interest, direct or indirect, in accordance with the Municipal Conflict of Interest Act. I will be faithful and bear true allegiance to His Majesty King Charles III. I will be faithful and bear true allegiance to His Majesty King Charles III. And I make this solemn promise and declaration conscientiously, believing it to be true and knowing that it is of the same force and effect as if made under oath. Thank you, members. Please be seated. I can now confirm that I have the declarations of office taken by all the members of council, and in accordance with the City of Toronto Act 2006, this now completes the organization of the council for the City of Toronto. I will now call on each member of council to come forward to receive a copy of their declaration of office from Mayor Tory. And we'll start first with Ward 1, Etobicoke North, Councillor Vincent Crisanti. Ward 2, Etobicoke Centre, Councillor Stephen Holliday. <laughs> Ward 3, Etobicoke Lakeshore, Councillor Amber Morley. <laughs> Ward 4, Parkdale High Park, Councillor Gord Perks. Ward 5, York Southwestern, Councillor Francis Nunziata. <laughs> Ward 6, York Center. Councillor James Pasternak. <laughs> Ward 
Ward 7, Humber River, Black Creek. Councillor Anthony Peruzza. Ward 8. Ward 8, Eglinton Lawrence, Councillor Mike Cole. <laughs> Ward 9, Davenport, Councillor Alejandra Bravo. Ward 11, University Rosedale, Councillor Diane Sachs. If you just pardon, uh, pardon me, I skipped Ward 10, Spadina, Fort York. <laughs> Councillor Ozma Malik. Ward 12, Toronto St. Paul's, Councillor Josh Matlow. Ward 13, Toronto Centre, Councillor Chris Moyes. Ward 14, Toronto Danforth, Councillor Paula Fletcher. <laughs> Ward 15, Don Valley West. Councillor Jay Robinson. <clears throat> Award 16, Don Valley East, Councillor John Birdside. Councillor Burnside is not with us in the chamber today, but will receive his presentation from the mayor in due course. Ward 17, Don Valley North, Councillor Shelley Carroll.
Ward 18, Willowdale, Councillor Lily Chang. Ward 19, Beaches East York, Councillor Brad Bradford. Ward 20, Scarborough Southwest, Councillor Gary Crawford. <laughs> Ward 21, Scarborough Centre, Councillor Michael Thompson. Ward 22, Scarborough Agent Court, Councillor Nick Mantis. Ward 23, Scarborough North, Councillor Jamal Myers. Ward 24, Scarborough Guildwood, Councillor Paul Ainsley. Ward 25, Scarborough Rouge Park, Councillor Jennifer McKelvey. Members of Council, would you please rise if you are able? Members of Council. Honored guests, I present to you the Mayor and members of Toronto City Council for the 2022 to 2026 term of office.
Thank you. Please be seated. I now call upon His Worship, Mayor John Tory, to give his first meeting address to City Council. Well, Mr. Clerk, uh, thank you. And first of all, may I thank you and your staff, as always, for uh, organizing all of this, which includes, of course, all of our honored guests today. And I am... Uh, The new members will come to know that nothing much happens without these people here and all the people that stand behind them, and uh, that's, that's good for us and good for the people of the City of Toronto. Uh, members of Council and honoured guests, at one and all, uh, good afternoon. I want to begin uh, beyond my thanks to the clerk and the staff uh, for, uh, to thank Elder Gary Sue and Elder Tina and uh, also the uh, Young Creek Big Drum uh, for both the meaningful ceremony that some of you didn't see that was out in Nathan Phillips Square earlier today, but also for their participation in this a ceremony. I think both, uh, but in particular the ceremony outside earlier today was a meaningful addition to uh, the inauguration of a city council and I think uh, a lot of the words that were spoken uh, were words uh, truly to take to heart and I certainly have done so and uh, I hope that uh, all of us will, not just the members of council. I am of course uh, deeply grateful for the faith and trust of the people that put in me to lead our city for four more years. I stand here today uh, thanks to the mandate that I've received from voters across the city and I'm committed to serving them uh, and building up their city uh, each and every day of the four years. And I know in, in congratulating all the members of council who similarly got elected uh, on the same day in October that they share that commitment. And I want to recognize and congratulate every single member of council on their election. I will say as people came up here today, and it wasn't the first time because I've had a chance to meet with them several times each uh, during the course of the last couple of weeks, um, that I think some of the change that's taking place in the council is the ch has changed for the good. Uh, finally, uh, the, the council is beginning, and it's just beginning uh, to uh, seem more like the city that it represents, and of course the mix of people, I was going to say new and old, but that would be, a, I shouldn't say that, mix of new and more experienced uh, councillors I think is going to be very good uh, for the city as well. But I welcome all the members of council and congratulate them all, but especially, um, it is a special day for every councillor, but it's particularly meaningful for the new councillors, uh, including seven members elected for the first time. It's, I think all of you know, everybody in this chamber will know what a significant uh, decision it is just to seek public office. It's a courageous decision, uh, but it's also a gratifying and challenging experience to be successful. And I look forward to working constructively uh, with all the members of council. I think it is also an appropriate time to thank the friends and family and the uh, staff members of the councillors, uh, new and, and experienced. Uh, you have already and you will, I assure you, sacrifice uh, going forward as a result of the responsibilities of the councillors being sworn in today. And that is a contribution to the well-being of the City of Toronto for which I, on behalf of all of these uh, colleagues of mine and myself, I thank you uh, for that contribution. I thank you for a contribution to date and I thank you for contributions I assure you you'll be making uh, going forward. As we begin the new term, I'm hugely hopeful about the future of our city, but there are challenges in front of the council that we have to take on together. Housing, homelessness, community safety, climate change, these are all issues among uh, many others that will continue to challenge us this term. And all of these efforts, all of these efforts, every single thing we deal with here, hundreds of items on the agenda of each meeting of council are things that require the efforts and the ideas of each and every one of us. And it is this all hands on deck imperative that has me absolutely committed to working with every single member of city council who is willing to work with me to get things done for the people of the city of Toronto. Serving as, as mayor of the city continues to be the honor of a lifetime. It is the, I cannot tell you the privilege that is involved in, in serving in this job and trying to get things done. I love the city as I think all the members do and all of you do. We all love the city and we know that it is, if not the best, it is one of the very best places to live in the entire world. And we all love working for the people of the city of Toronto, for you. Uh, that is why I certainly ran for re-election and I think it's true of everybody uh, being sworn in today. Having gratefully received in my own case such a strong citywide mandate to move forward, that's exactly what I'll be trying to do, which is to get things done. That is what people sent us here to do. I know from talking to Deputy Mayor Jennifer McKelvey and so many councillors over the last few weeks that you all are equally determined to get to work. In the last eight years, we've made so much progress on getting transit and housing built, on growing our economy. Voters across the city have told us they want to see that progress continue including cooperation and partnership with the other governments. They do not wish to see us return to the days of conflict and inaction, which led us to a transit deficit and led us to a housing crisis. 
So this term, I will be focused on delivering on that mandate for residents in every part of our city, in Scarborough, in downtown, in North York, and in Etobicoke. We're going to get housing built, much more housing, and much more affordable and supportive housing. We're going to get the $28 billion transit plan built, the Scarborough subway, the Ontario line, the Eglinton Crosstown West extension, the Young North extension, and I am determined, as I'm sure you are, to make sure that the Eglinton East and waterfront transit lines move forward, as well as planning for the Shepherd and Humber College airport connections. We are going to do everything we can to keep our city affordable for the residents who live here and for those who want to live here. We are going to do everything we can to keep our city safe and to support our police as they continue to modernize and to build trust, in some cases to rebuild trust, and to keep us safe. Building on our pandemic experience, we will support all the community organizations who work to help the people who need it the most. We learned a lot about the role they could play, a lot more. We already knew a lot, but we learned more about what those organizations at the grassroots in the community could do to help people and to help us in our job. We're going to make sure the City Hall is focused on the nuts and bolts services that people rely on every single day. On that front, we can do better, we will do better, and we must do better. We're going to do everything we can as a city government to make sure that Toronto's economic recovery is one that brings us back to an economy that is stronger than ever. This is vital, and this must happen in a way that includes every single part of the city and every single person who lives in the city. We're going to do all we can as a municipal government, working with the provincial and federal governments to address mental health and substance issues. This is an area where collectively we are falling short. The isolation and lack of support for people experiencing mental illness or substance use issues is evident when you just walk down the street or ride public transit. And that is not even considering those who are suffering or in many cases dying alone. Losing 500 people, 500 people to drug overdoses is as tragic as it is unacceptable. It is not a moral or legal issue, it is a health care issue. And while I stand here today and pledge all possible action by the city, the core efforts, the core efforts and the core initiatives and the core funding must come from the other governments, especially the provincial government. We're going to make sure our city remains united, a place that rejects hatred and strife and divisiveness, so much of which we see in other parts of the world. This is absolutely fundamental to our way of life. My eyes, like yours, are open to the seemingly continuous tragedy that does flow from discrimination and disrespect. It often begins there with even small acts of discrimination and disrespect and, and, and it then expands to things that are much worse. Respect for each other and our differences is at the core of why people want to come and live in Toronto from around the world. And we have to be very determined to keep it that way. Right now, we're facing very serious fiscal challenges. Despite the fact that we've maintained our credit ratings through the pandemic due to what the rating agencies call prudent fiscal management, the seriousness of our city's financial situation cannot be understated. And it comes at a time when residents and businesses themselves are grappling with inflation and increased costs. I heard that, as I'm sure you did, throughout the election campaign. Namely, that people are struggling and that the city government must not make affordability worse right now by, among other things, imposing big tax increases that people simply can't afford. I am continuing to advocate to the federal and provincial governments to deliver on their promised support for our city's 2022 COVID shortfall. The required support arises entirely out of the extraordinary financial impacts of the pandemic on things like transit revenues and shelter costs. Both Prime Minister Trudeau and Premier Doug Ford committed to providing this 2022 pandemic-related support during their respective elections. Those commitments were clear, they were sensible, and they were fair in light of the size and complexity of our city and simply in light of the fact that we were, we were absolutely committed to undertaking those expenditures, especially to protect people who are most vulnerable in the face of an unprecedented pandemic. And so, we're dealing with an $815 million COVID-19 hangover in our 2022 budget. This isn't something we can tax our way out of, and it isn't something that we can or should cut our way out of. It represents the 2022 cost of the excellent job this city did, and that includes each and every one of you. I have referred to the councillors, but also to all of the people of the City of Toronto. It refers to the excellent job we did collectively, working with the other governments and with their support during the years of that pandemic to achieve world-leading results on saving lives 
and protecting residents. And I think it's only fair that the City of Toronto should receive the support of those governments, more support, because I acknowledge with gratitude the support we've received so far. But 2022 was another year in the pandemic where we experienced the things that led to this COVID shortfall. We need that immediate financial support for the good of the city and its economy and its residents to protect services and in particular to protect capital projects and all of the jobs that they support. I'm encouraged by the fact that the province of Ontario has publicly committed to providing funding if the government of Canada comes to the table. I've been continuing to advocate relentlessly to our Deputy Prime Minister and National Minister of Finance, Christian Freeland, because this COVID funding is fair and it is necessary for our complete recovery. I am patient and I am persistent, both, because I have learned how these partnerships work. One of the reasons I wanted to seek and, and, and have received a mandate to be in this office again is because I think people understand I know how these partnerships can work for the benefit of the people of the City of Toronto as they must. And I hope that my track record can allow people to support me as I go about this work as mayor. Whether it be the city government or your own household, we all will have to face economic and financial challenges in the coming months. Beyond the immediate 2022 budget issue that I've been discussing arising out of the pandemic, the city itself is looking at a more than $1 billion budget crunch for 2023. We will have to navigate the budget in the months ahead, but I raise it here today so that we all know that the work ahead much work ahead will be needed to make sure that we both protect frontline services and keep a disciplined eye on affordability, as I mentioned earlier. All of this speaks to a better way. It speaks to the need, the profound need, for a stable, predictable funding model for our city, whether it comes directly from the other governments or whether it comes from financing methods that the city is enabled to implement. I am committed to once again having those absolutely necessary conversations with the other two governments about how cities, major cities like Toronto, but not confined to Toronto, are financed and how we can chart a new path forward because we simply have to do better in that area as well. Make no mistake and let me be very clear. For Toronto and many other cities in Canada, but we are the biggest and we are the economic engine of this country, the status quo is not working. How and where public funds are derived and distributed in Canada and Ontario are part of a regime developed when most Canadians lived in small towns and rural areas, whereas today, 80% of Canadians live in cities. And this is the biggest city in the country, and this is the city that is absolutely, that its success is absolutely imperative to the success of the rest of the country. I say often when I'm being interviewed, some of you might have seen me say it, that people don't like it when I say these things on television, on the national programs about how important Toronto is and its success. It's not just important to us, and we're all proud Canadians. It's important to the success of this country that this city be working properly. And the status quo when it comes to how we finance our activities and programs and services is outdated, it is ineffective, and it is just plain wrong. And I will be leading the charge as the Mayor of Toronto, Ontario, and Canada's biggest city to find an effective and realistic way to address this. I know that we've tried this before, but it is time to try it again and to try it with even more energy and determination than ever before. Le statu quo en, en matière de financement des grandes villes ne fonctionne pas. Les dispositions actuelles sont obsolètes et erronées et nous devons simplement trouver un moyen avec les autres gouvernements de régler ce problème. Une grande majorité des Canadiens vivent dans les villes qui n'ont pas les ressources nécessaires et il, il est temps que nous nous asseyons et que nous trouvions quelque chose de mieux. At the same time, as we face these budget challenges, the funding for our housing efforts is threatened by the initial form of the province's new housing legislation known as Bill 23. While we will discuss the full impact of this bill at our meeting tomorrow, staff predict that this could have a more than $200 million annual impact. So all the problems I've just laid out that exist already, some of them are related to COVID and others related to the complete inadequacy and ineffectiveness of the way cities are funded, is added to by a piece of legislation that, that threatens to have us lose $200 million much needed to pay for growth, to pay for the sewers and the transit and other things that are needed. This is a change, make no mistake, that will hurt our ability to get housing built and just as importantly, maybe more importantly in its own way, to make sure that a reasonable quantity of that new housing that is built is affordable. To make sure it's affordable for people who need help the most. And as a city, we must push back 
against this legislation. I am working day and night on this issue. I have been since it was introduced. The discussions are constructive and they're happening. So I'll leave it at that. But I think as a council, we will have the opportunity to make our voices heard at, at our meeting tomorrow. So those are the three major financial challenges our city is facing right now. The COVID hangover, the outdated financing of cities in the 21st century, and the threats posed by Bill 23. I am seized with these issues because I know they threaten our ability to deliver the key services and make the capital investments residents rightly expect from their city government. I raise these financial issues here because these are serious matters on which we must work together and there are issues on which it is crucial that Council stand in united support of my efforts on the behalf of the City and on behalf of the Council. Now these major challenges do not in the least dampen my optimism about what lies ahead. I know that each and every one of the colleagues, my colleagues on City Council, feel the same way as I do. You have to go to any event in the City, even sad events can inspire you with respect to what the City represents in terms of that respect and the embracing of people that I mentioned earlier in terms of the enterprise, in terms of just a whole lot of things that make this, that make this, and I firmly believe this in my heart, the best place in the world in which to live. I have never been more optimistic about the city's future than I am today. Why? Well, first and foremost, because I saw, as we all did, how this city and this city government responded to the unprecedented challenge of the pandemic. Never before in our lifetime and long way back, if ever, has anything like this happened that challenged our city in the way that it did and challenged our city government at the same time. And the government with lots of partners out there uh, that made up Team Toronto, we worked together and at lightning speed, we helped people who needed help the most. We supported those hit hardest by the pandemic. We protected the frontline services that we knew people needed more than ever. And when the vaccine arrived, Team Toronto, and that was a big team, worked to make sure that we achieved world leading vaccination rates. I think we should stop and think about that for a moment, that we led the world among big cities in, in, in people getting vaccinated. And what was fascinating about it was, yes, the usual apparatus, you know, convinced a lot of people of the merits of getting vaccinated and, and, and helped them to get that done. But we did something more. We recognized the fact that people's lived experiences were often different and, and their own circumstances were different and it forged a certain view they might have had, even the view about whether it was health authorities or politicians or others talking to them about how they could best handle this health crisis. And instead what we did is we went to the local pastors and the local community health workers and the local community workers and others who joined us in going and knocking on those doors one by one by one by one, talking to people about why it was good for them to get vaccinated. Trusted faces, trusted people, holding trusted positions, and we did that and we supported those people and I think going forward we can make continued use of those very same people because they can accomplish often things that we can't necessarily accomplish ourselves because they are trusted and they are known and they have experiences and other things that are closer to that of the people that we serve. And so I think that we face down that challenge and we should learn from that our ability to face down almost any challenge. In fact, I would say any challenge and I have confidence from our experience during the pandemic that we can face the challenges ahead the expected ones and the unexpected ones, because after all, we all know the pandemic was not an expected a challenge. So what will success look like for the City Council four years from now? I, I tried to summarize some of that on election night and I'll try to summarize some of it today because you can't be complete in what success will mean because you have to deal with the unexpected, but I thought it was important to share this view of mine with all of you here today. More housing will be getting built and it will be happening faster than ever before more homes will have been open to families and more will be on the way. The supply of affordable and supportive housing will have been significantly increased and this will contribute hugely to our efforts to eradicate chronic homelessness, which must be, which must be a priority of ours over the next four years. Transit will have remained on track. More transit lines will be open with more on the way. Our economy will be booming again. Businesses will be thriving. People will be continuing to invest here. More jobs will have been created and those jobs will be available to all Torontonians without exception. Again, I'm struck by the fact that as I visit, and some of you represent areas that I'm discussing here, when I visit some of the Northeast and some of the Northwest and some of the downtown, that when we were experiencing a tech boom and some of that has continued, that might as well be happening on another planet for some of the people who live in some of those parts of the city. And you know, the solution to that, to connect those well-educated, ambitious, energetic people and their families up to the companies that are hiring, isn't really that complicated. 
It's a challenge, but we can meet that challenge. And that is one that I think will be a definition of our success or not. I hope it is, that we've made that connection better. Transit will help a lot. That's why you build it, not just to put lines on a map, but to connect people to opportunity, and people, whether it's educational opportunity or new jobs. So our, new, our economy will be booming, businesses will be thriving, and people will be continuing to invest here, and those jobs will be available to Torontonians from all parts of the city without exception. Toronto will have remained a destination of choice for individuals and companies and entrepreneurs from around the world, bringing their skills and their energy and their investments to help us to grow. The city will be more focused than ever on serving its residents, providing the best level of basic service so people are confident they're getting good value for their tax dollars. Our roads will be safer for everyone. We will have a safe city. We will have very bold initiatives well underway in the arts and in new parks and in open spaces and we'll be on track with our properly ambitious environmental goals. I've made commitments that I take very seriously in my own platform seeking election to do some very bold things with respect to parks and open spaces because we have to. We can't grow as a city without having some of these things happen and there are challenges that have been put in front of us in achieving some of those things in the past but we're going to have to keep working at it and get it done. Those who've been marginalized will be able to feel four years from today, if we've been successful, a real sense of progress and hope on jobs, on transit, on housing. We will have continued to come together as a city. And you know, we are a beacon to the world, but if you look at it, it's kind of like interprovincial free trade. It's that elusive target. Even with all the progress we've made in the last years of coming together and stopping a lot of that kind of rivalry and, 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 and that kind of thing that exists between different parts of the city, I hope that four years from now, success will mean that we've come together even more as a city, but come together in another respect as well, in that every single person who lives here will feel welcome, will feel respected, will feel included, and will feel secure. That is what I would call, without excluding anything, a solid foundation for a successful next four years. And it's what I will work hard with City Council to deliver, to deliver for residents, to get these things done. I've been working nonstop since the election day, and I'm eager to keep working with this council, with the other governments, and with the people, with those organizations and individuals that I talked about that can help us get the job done even better. Now, there have been concerns raised even today about the proposed strong mayor process, and let me address those concerns now. First of all, my leadership style and overall approach consistently demonstrated over eight years, and no one can deny that, consistently demonstrated over eight years, that approach will not change because I am the same person I was the day before the election. I will continue to work with the Council and those who want to work with me to get things done, as we have done together for two terms. If there's one thing we can do to build confidence in us and in the process and, and the government that we're a part of, it is to get more things done together. That is probably more fundamental to building confidence in the system than anything else, just getting more things done and trying not to uh, be the divided group and the fractious group that sometimes we can be. And it's been better over the last uh, eight years and the last four years even. And I believe that the partnership that I've had as mayor with the council and for that matter with the other governments has been fundamental to our success and that we can recreate and improve upon with our new members and others that kind of partnership to get things done. Those partnerships secured, and let's not forget this, billions, billions of dollars to build housing and to build transit and to get a meaningful start on what we have to do on things like supportive housing. And that must continue. We must continue to work together and to work with the other governments and, and advocate to them as necessary to make sure that we keep that money coming for the good of our city and the good of our residents. But the fact is we have a housing crisis and we have a situation in which we had only built a handful, a handful of transit, station, as transit stations over decades. That is the situation. We have a housing crisis and we only had built a handful of transit stations over decades. Having just contested an election as you did, an election in which I uniquely knocked on thousands of doors right across the city, I don't think it was anyone else that had the privilege of doing that, people told me they were giving me a mandate to get things done, to get more housing built faster and to get the transit built. People want this work to get done and I think most people understand that to continue to do things exactly as we have been doing them and to expect a different result is not realistic. I've made no secret about the fact that I have fought my last election as a candidate. My fight now is not a political fight, it is a fight against time. And it is not a fight against time in terms of how much time I have left in public office, that's four years. 
It's a fight against time on behalf of the people that we serve and the needs that they have, which in many cases are desperate, especially when it comes to housing. It is a fight for the housing and for the transit that people desperately need. I am here to get as much done as possible now. And you'll be able to see that my motives are pure because I am not seeking re-election. I am here to do this job with as much energy and hard work and collaboration as ever. But I'm here to do it without any thought that I will be seeking any office. I am doing what people sent me here to do as the mayor. And I set out a very clear set of things that I wanted to accomplish and they gave me a very clear mandate right across the city to do it. And so dealing specifically with the strong mayor legislation, I will first of all tell you, every action I take under the strong mayor legislation, because a part of it is in force already, will be public. It will be documented for everyone to see, as I believe it should be. At our council meeting next month, we will receive a report from our city staff detailing this system and how it works, because the bill and the regulations literally just came into force yesterday. I got a meeting from a letter from the minister indicating that. In the meantime, on the subject of the so-called proactive veto, which is not yet passed into law, I will commit to this council that I would only utilize this measure on housing and transit matters of citywide importance. Any such proposed use would always be preceded by a staff report. I was explaining earlier today to some people that, as you know, that is the foundation of any action undertaken by anybody in this building. A staff report where they independently and professionally set out their thoughts, their research, and their recommendations on a given matter. And I am committing here today, first, that I will only utilize this measure on housing and transit matters of citywide importance. Second, that any proposed use would always be preceded by a staff report, independently written by our staff. And thirdly, that I will, without exception, without exception, try first to forge a consensus through the use of the council process. I think these are uh, meaningful commitments that I have made uh, as mayor and we'll have to see what unfolds with respect uh, to this legislation uh, going forward. I know that our best days and Toronto's best days still lie in front of us. There's no reason to believe otherwise. I know from talking to people from around the world who look to invest here, who are studying the city and trying to figure out the things we've done right, knowing that it's not perfect. But the best days of the city lie ahead. Why? Because when you go places as we all go, and you see the young people that are coming up that represent the next generation of Torontonians and council members and mayors and business leaders and academics and labor leaders, you can see that they're just as smart and they're just as determined, they're as diverse, they're as wonderful in their outlook on this city and how we can make it better as I've ever seen and I'm sure that you agree. But there's much work to be done. There's much work to be done on their behalf and on behalf of every single person who lives here. I know that this City Council can get that work done and can do it in the months and years ahead. Because I think the people have sent us a message. If there was one that was sent at all, it is that you need to get more done faster on some of these crucial issues that are important to people and to families and to businesses in the city. I look forward to making real progress with the same genuine sincerity and love um, for the process that I'm a part of. I cannot describe to you the respect that I have uh, for the process that I've been a part of for a good part of my life now in one way or another. And I think you feel the same way. And I think that we can together um, take this sacred responsibility we've been given, this great privilege that we've been given to serve the people of Toronto and get things done for them, for them and for their families, for all the people who are going to come here, for all the children that are not yet born, that we can do the things that we're expected to do uh, to make this exactly what I think it is already, but to keep it the best place in the world in which to live and to make sure that we stay there at the very top of that list. And it's not about lists. It's about the quality of life and the values that are so important. And in a world where those values seem every day, in one way or another, in one shape or form or another, for some reason, to be under threat, uh, I think that we can continue to set an example here and to continue to be a way of life that is admired around the world and that will want people to come here. But just even if they don't want to come here, they will admire uh, what we're doing here uh, in the city of Toronto. So now, it's time to get to work. And I'm looking forward to working with each and every one of you, as I've said several times, and that's no accident because that is the way I've approached the job before and it is a way I will approach it until my last day in office, which will come four years from now. Thank you very much.
Gentlemen, um, gentlemen, we will be proceeding to do some of the business that's part, again, of the organization of the Council. Uh, and the first thing we will do is to elect a speaker and deputy speaker. And I have consented uh, in writing to this election in accordance with Council's procedures. Uh, my letter dated November the 16th, 2022, was distributed with the agenda. And just to explain that, I could, but I still can sit here as the chair and the head of Council and, and preside over the meetings, but I decided when I was first made mayor that it would be better um, to have uh, others uh, do that who might uh, take that opportunity and so they're elected uh, on nomination uh, by the council and uh, I realized how wise that decision was as time went on but then I do thank the people in advance who are willing to have their names put forward uh, to uh, fulfill this duty and others have done it beyond those who are uh, who are going to be uh, nominated today so nominations for speaker are now open are there any nominations for speaker Councillor McKelvey Thank you, Mr. Mayor. It's uh, my delight to nominate Councillor Francis Nunziata as Speaker. Thank you, Councillor McKelvey. Uh, Councillor Francis Nunziata has been nominated for Speaker. I'm uh, calling again for further nominations for the Office of Speaker. Are there any further nominations for Speaker? Call one more time. Any further nominations for Speaker? Well, nominations are now closed. And uh, Councillor Francis Nunziata is the only nominee for the position of Speaker. Uh, and we will have a vote on the election of Councillor Nunziata as Speaker. Uh, it will be a recorded vote, and the City Clerk will explain the voting procedure. Mayor Tory has asked for a recorded vote. Uh, all members um, in favor of the motion to appoint Councillor Francis Nunziata as Speaker, would you please raise your hand and leave your hand uh, raised until you hear your name called? And all in favor, it's Councillor Thompson, Councillor Morley, Councillor Pasternak, Councillor Carroll, Councillor Holliday, Councillor Mantis, Councillor Moyes, Councillor Crisanti, Councillor Robinson, Councillor Cole, Councillor Perks. Councillor Nunziata, Councillor Peruzza, Councillor Crawford, Councillor Bradford, Councillor Sachs, Councillor Fletcher, Councillor Ainsley, Councillor McKelvey, Councillor Bravo, Councillor Myers, Councillor Malik, Councillor Cheng. And Councillor Burnside, are you connected to the meeting and can you indicate your vote? Thank you. Yes. Thank you, Councillor Burnside. In the affirmative, Mayor Tory. Your vote, please. Oh, I, well, I had my hand up. I'm sorry, Mayor Tory. <laughs> All those opposed, please raise your hand and keep your hand raised until you hear your name called. Councillor Matlow. Mayor, the motion carries. The vote is 25 to 1. Thank you, uh, Mr. Council. And I will confirm uh, that Councillor Francis Nunziata has duly been elected as speaker and on our behalf extend not just our congratulations but our good wishes for a very productive uh, term ahead in what I know is a very challenging job and I thank you for your willingness to take it on. I don't know if anybody asked me. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and thank you very much, um, Mr. Mayor, for your respect and support in the past eight years and I want to thank all members of council here and uh, newly elected councillors as well. I'm looking forward to working uh, with you for the next four years and all members of council, let's work hard for the next four years and please let's try to respect each other. Thank you. It's customary when those kinds of nominations are uh, requested that you ask the person if they're willing to accept. We never did that because we, I, didn't want, I didn't want to ask the question. We just wanted to proceed. I, I do accept. <laughs> Thank you very much. So now members of council will proceed with the election of deputy speaker and nominations for deputy speaker are now open. Are there any nominations for deputy speaker? Uh, Councillor Carroll. I don't know. There, there it goes. Uh, yes, as, as deputy speaker emeritus, I'd like to nominate my colleague, Councillor Holliday. <laughs> Councillor Stephen Holliday has been uh, uh, nominated for the position of deputy speaker. I will just ask you, do you accept uh, that nomination? Just I'll do that as we go through. 
Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Holliday. Um, I'll call for nominations again. Are there any further nominations for the Office of Deputy Speaker? I'll call one more time. Are there any further nominations for the Office of Deputy Speaker? Well, I will declare that the uh, nomination is closed, and I think consistent with the past practice, we will have a recorded vote on uh, the appointment of Stephen Holliday as the Deputy Speaker. And if you could conduct that vote, Mr. Clerk, that would be appreciated. Members, all those in favor, please raise your hand and leave your hand uh, up until you hear your name called. Councillor Thompson, Councillor Morley, Councillor Pasternak, Councillor Carroll, Councillor Holliday, Councillor Matlow, Councillor Mantis, Councillor Moyes, Councillor Crisanti, Councillor Robinson, Councillor Cole, and Councillor Perks. Mayor Tory. <laughs> <laughs> Mayor Tory. Uh, <laughs> Councillor Nunziata, Councillor Perusa, Councillor Crawford, Councillor Bradford, Councillor Sachs, Councillor Fletcher, Councillor Ainsley, Councillor uh, McKelvey, Councillor Bravo, Councillor Myers, Councillor Malik. Councillor Chang. And Councillor Burnside, how do you vote, sir? In favor. Thank you. Mayor, the motion uh, carries unanimously, 26 in favor. Thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Stephen Holliday has been duly elected as our Deputy Speaker, and I'll congratulate you and ask you, uh, I, I will just say that I think we all know that Councillor Holliday, including those who are new, will find out if they don't know already. He's a person who deeply respects of this place and I'm sure he's very proud as is his father who's here somewhere a former deputy mayor uh, Doug Holliday who's here and I'm sure he's very proud of uh, the election of his son as the deputy uh, speaker and I'll ask if you wanted to say a few words yourself uh, thank you mayor and colleague members of council I really just wanted to express my gratitude for your trust and your support in electing me role of Deputy Speaker. Most importantly though, I want to acknowledge the incredible job that Francis Nunziata, Speaker Francis Nunziata has done over the years in guiding this council through many days, many hours. That's with skill and experience. I consider that the gold standard and I pledge to work very hard to live up to that standard. Um, I do approach the next council term with optimism and energy, and I look forward to many hours in this council chamber and working with each and every one of you. And I just want to take the opportunity to wish everybody all the best in the weeks, the months, and the years ahead. Thank you. And may I just say, because uh, uh, Councillor Carroll in nominating uh, Deputy Speaker uh, Holliday uh, indicated she was the Deputy Speaker Emeritus, and just say thank you. I think uh, Councillor Holliday will find that being the Deputy Speaker is kind of like being the Maytag repair person in that you're sort of waiting around for the Speaker to actually leave the chair, uh, which she never seems to do, and I don't quite understand how all that works, but having said that, we're lucky that she's so diligent, and we're lucky to have you as the Deputy Speaker. It's kind of like being one of those backup goalies that you know can get called out of the stands at a moment's notice to put on the pads, but uh, we're happy that you've been elected, and I thank Councillor Carroll for her uh, service as Deputy Speaker in the last uh, term. <laughs> I don't think I can get used to sitting up here, and certainly this chain, I can tell you, it's a, a crink in your neck from wearing it, but nonetheless. We will now, members, consider the appointment of a striking committee. Uh, I submitted a letter to the council agenda announcing my appointment of the deputy mayor as chair of the committee and with recommended membership. Uh, deputy Mayor uh, McKelvey, you have uh, a motion on the item. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. That City Council appoint the following members of Council to the Striking Committee for a term of office ending December 31st, 2024, or until their successors are appointed. Councillor Francis Nunziata, Councillor Brad Bradford, Councillor James Pasternak, and Councillor Gary Crawford. Deputy Mayor has read the motion. Are there any speakers on the item? All right, hearing none, then I'll call the question. Uh, all those in favor of the motion? Opposed, if any? I did, has everybody voted? Okay, then the motion is carried. Um, and I believe now we have Council Carroll with a motion uh, to introduce the confirmatory bills. Council Carroll? Yes, that leave be granted to introduce bills to confirm to the point of the introduction of this motion the proceedings of City Council meeting number one on November 23rd, 2022. Shall leave be granted to introduce these bills? All in favor? Carried. 
Shall these bills be declared as bylaws and be passed subject to section 226.9 of the City of Toronto Act 2006? All in favor? Carry. Members of Council, uh, before we recess for today, I'd like to remind you that the Striking Committee will meet tomorrow morning at 9.30 in the morning to consider member appointments to committees and boards as well as the 2023 Council schedule. And if there's no uh, other business, this meeting of City Council is now recessed until noon tomorrow, Thursday, November 24th. Thank you, and thank you all for attending this very important meeting. Congratulations on your tree. Three, three, three.